Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Psalms Bible Study uh, today, uh, the 30th of August, 2020. And as we are continuing through the book of Psalms, we have Psalm 111, which we had on the study guide on Wednesday evening, but we had such good discussion, we didn't get to it. So with that introduction, we're going to move on. It actually works out well theme-wise that we move on to Psalm 111 now because uh, Psalm 111 uh, has, a, has a good fit with, um, with this section here of, of God's word. And it actually goes well with Psalm 112. Um, 111, interestingly, you won't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's an acrostic psalm, which means that each successive line uh, starts with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and, and that's not the ver according to the verse numbering. It is according to the lines in the English. Uh, just think of it A, B, C, and going on, but of course, it's the Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet for all of you who have memorized your Hebrew alphabet. Um, Psalm 111, uh, it, it introduces this section of Psalms 111 through 119 that talk about God's work and his word. And um, this Psalm begins and ends with praise. It is a, a part of the, uh, it's also going to see the praise will get more in depth as we get to Psalm 113 today and a Passover Hallel or Passover praise that we that we have but I'll talk more about that at that Psalm. Um, so God's works and his word from Psalm 111 and uh, Kathy I have you on the top of my list of would you read verses one through to the first half of seven so the opening praise through God's works. Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic is his work and his righteousness stands forever. He has set up a memorial to his wonders. Gracious and compassionate is the Lord. He gives food to those who fear him he remembers his covenant forever. He has declared the power of his deeds to his people to give them the nations as their possession. The works of his hands are truth and justice. Yeah, thank you for reading there. Um, beginning this Psalm with praise, the Psalm's gonna end with praise as well. And remember, praise the Lord is the Hebrew hallelujah. And um, this, uh, describes God's works and his word, and my notes really thinking this through, God's works and his word uh, are not things that can be separated. We don't separate those themes, um, because God works through his word. That's how he's chosen to work. Um, he doesn't have to confine, confine himself to a cart, uh, as it were, um, that's how, how the crass uh, evangelicals of, of, um, or uh, reformed people of Luther's day said, oh, the, God doesn't, they wanted God to work without means. Uh, Luther said, no, God has limited himself to working through his word and the sacraments. Um, so God does work immediately, as it were, and that's how he has limited himself. But when, when, then when God speaks his word, what he says he will also take action and go to his work. Um, the verses two through seven, as Kathy read, uh, really outline the, the creation, his majestic work that we see. And, uh, but then the preservation is also there, that giving food, remembering uh, his people, his power is declared. But then mixed in with that as well is the redemption, that his righteousness stands, and that righteousness that he has is also gracious and, and compassionate. Um, basically, this Psalm 111 says, don't you forget God's work. Don't forget it because, uh, because it's so important and it is such a benefit to us. And we have ways to, to avoid forgetting, right? We even memorize things like the Apostles' Creed. 
um, and, and portions of scripture that guide us that don't forget God's works. Uh, thoughts or questions or comments on this, uh, this first half of Psalm 111, God's works? Okay, um, so uh, we will move on then to God's word as it stands. And Carol, you are next on my list. If you don't mind reading here, um, uh, where it says God's word through the closing praise. Okay. All his precepts are trustworthy, steadfast forever and ever, done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption for his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginnings of wisdom. All who do his precepts have good understanding. Closing praise. His praise stands forever. Thank you for reading there as we take a look at uh, this section of his word. Um, uh, 119, this Psalm 119, um, which this Psalm kind of introduces the section, 119 will conclude it. And, um, and that's really God's word. From A to Z, it's the longest uh, psalm, but um, when we, we have a very brief introduction to it, you know, like a, just about three and a half verses, his precepts, uh, really another word for God's word. Um, and what we see is that God's word not only shares what God has done, God's word also re shows how we respond to his works. So precepts are trustworthy, so what should we do? Um, well, since they stand forever and ever, we believe his promises, what he says. Um, he sent redemption, uh, and so we see that about his name, and we're going to live according to his name, that we see he does this in truth and righteousness. We walk in our life according to that truth and uprightness. And what do we respond to? How do we respond to his word in verse 10? Well, the fear of the Lord, which we know is the beginning of wisdom. Um, it's echoed in a lot of the Proverbs, those wise sayings say the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Well, the Psalms share that truth as well. Uh, but what is fear? Uh, not being afraid. Again, um, just recognizing a reminder that it's awe, it's respect. It's saying, God, I recognize your position. I'm going to respect you uh, and everything you revealed, everything you've done. Uh, and so when, when believers have this God's word in their lives and respond by believing, living, and uh, according to it and fearing God, uh, that's a foundation for our lives that if we plant our feet on that and, and walk uh, our way of life on this solid ground, it leads to blessings on earth and, and in eternity. And those blessings are going to be brought out in the next psalm. Uh, any questions from anybody on uh, this, uh, this Psalm 111, God's word, and, and the opening praise here? Opening praise, God's works, and his word. All right, nothing, uh, really a general introduction that we'll move quickly from. And and actually have a number of short psalms here, uh, mostly on the 10 verses or fewer here, these four that we're looking at today. Um, psalm 112, like I said, takes um, God's work and word and now talks more about how people who hear the, uh, of God's work and hear the word, how they respond and, and the blessings that follow. Uh, so uh, the... Previous description of God's work and word is followed by a description of the upright person who responds to that work and word. And, really, and here we have no heading of this psalm. The man who fears the Lord, again, are the editor's uh, comments for this section. Um, this psalm, uh, nine verses, actually 10 verses here, and, and going to have Niles read verses one through nine because. That's what comes up on the screen. And then I think I'll just take that last verse when we finish it up uh, very short. But uh, Niles, read about the man who fears the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
How blessed is a man who fears the Lord. In his commands he delights greatly. His descendants will be mighty in the land. The circle of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness stands forever. In darkness, light dawns for the upright. He is gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good things will come to the man who is gracious and lends, who conducts his business with justice. Surely he will never fall. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear until he looks in triumph on his looks in triumph on his foes. He scatters seeds. He gives hope to the poor. His righteousness stands forever. His horn will be lifted high in glory. So a man who fears the Lord, it starts again with hallelujah, uh, praise the Lord. And if we look at a summary of these characteristics of the upright man, um, well, he, he, he takes that word of the Lord, the commands, right? And, and he's happy about them. And, and that, uh, that uh, happiness in his commands is also mixed with uh, the fear of the Lord, believing, respecting, obeying God's word. Uh, these are the characteristics that come out. Um, but then as it describes the man in verse 4, gracious and compassionate and righteous, and you think, oh, you're talking about the Lord here? Uh, he's talking about God. Well, in general, he, that is a characteristic of God, but is also the characteristic of the man who fears the Lord, right? You're going to be, gen uh, you're going, when you are in God's word, you're also going to imitate the giver of that word with his graciousness and his compassionate nature. Um, generous uh, with his possessions, talks about sharing, uh, scattering seeds uh, in that way. You know, just like you, you scatter seeds and the more you sow the seed, the more good things come up. Uh, you consider that like giving to the poor, with, to those in need, just throwing it out there and and letting that, that good work and sometimes not even seeing how, how it happens. Um, and then also describes the uh, verse six, that the righteous will be remembered forever. And just recognizing that may not be something that, that, that individual believers um, are remembered on earth forever, but our righteous deeds follow us into heaven, as the book of Revelation says. And it's like a train that all those good deeds go with us. And, and yeah, they, they will be remembered. And as we praise the Lord, God says, you as my person or someone that I'm giving you credit for all of these things will remember these good deeds forever. Again, a gracious gift that God has given to the person who, who follows his word. And any questions specifically on uh, these, uh, these points that you see, the, these verses? Uh, Sue? Um, I'm a little confused on the, the um, second half of verse 8, where it says he will have no fear until he looks in triumph on his foes. Is that fear meaning um, that awe for God, okay. that respect for God? Then he, I, I yeah, don't know, I, maybe I'm just sleepy. No, you are, you're asking a good question because um, I'm not sure what it is in Hebrew. I didn't look it up, but this is the, this is, um, this would be better translated. He will not be afraid. That's what it's talking about here. And um, I have a comment in my notes that I didn't get to yet, uh, but since you brought it up, but we're not afraid of bad news. When we're in God's word, you know, bad news can come. Um, personal bad news we can share and think about and tell others about, but we're not afraid of it because uh, we know how our story ends, right? The bad news of getting sick with COVID, the bad news of financial upheaval, the bad news of losing a job, whatever bad news it is that hits us, it doesn't ruin a Christian, right? Because our story doesn't end on this earth. Our story lasts forever. And so um, we know we will look with triumph on our foes, uh, on all evil, sin, death, and the devil, and whatever other evil would, would try to harm us, um, but that will be, will be in heaven. So yeah, good, very good question, Sue. 
Anything else uh, here through, through verse 9, specifically the words and the verses that we've taken a look at here? Um, remember the verse 9, a cryptic, uh, but his horn, uh, this is his, his power, and the, the horn is a word that describes the strength of an individual. And we see an intertwining here, I wanted to make this comment as well, that the spiritual blessings, material blessings, are both described here of a man who fears the Lord. And as that's described, we see that that spiritual and material blessings, they really complement each other. Sometimes the spiritual blessings that we have are described in material terms. Jesus had parables describing that. And, and we have uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and, and those riches that uh, he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich not talking about money, but talking about rich spiritually. So, but while that is sometimes a picture, there's also times that, that God grants material blessings to those who spiritually follow him. And, and that works both ways. That a spiritual attitude will enable us to use material blessings wisely. So we can think about times in our lives when we have a windfall of, of, of extra cash or a bonus from work, or, or retirement benefits that are higher than expected, and we say, wow, what a blessing. And we know, okay, I'm not going to spend it frivolously. I'm still going to be a good steward of God's gifts, and, and I'm not going to set my heart on them even though my riches increase. We use those material blessings wisely. But then on the other hand, when God gives us the material blessings, sometimes it makes it easier to practice spiritual attitudes. For example, on Sunday morning, if I didn't have enough money to buy food, to have breakfast, I don't think I'd be able to focus very well in church, right? So those material blessings can help me practice a spiritual attitude. That's why I, Martin Luther said the uh, fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread, all about material blessings. It's right in the middle of all of the spiritual request, requests. Pretty much to remind us, yeah, trust God to give us what we need for our bodies, because as he takes care of our bodies, it allows us then to say, let, let, let me put my spiritual things first. I'm not worried about getting enough sleep or having a roof over my head. Um, and, and that lets me uh, have a spiritual attitude. The questions or comments on this description of a man who fears the Lord. Uh, Sue, please. Um, it, the idea of a spiritual attitude also, if you have a spiritual attitude, you may recognize some of your material blessings that you forget are really blessings that you take for granted. Yes. You know, you're not always looking for the, the, the great win, but, you know, just waking up every day or having food on your plate or just some of the little more mundane things. Yeah, right. Uh, we say mundane and it's actually a good word because that's how we consider it. But uh, when my stomach starts to growl, a piece of daily bread is not mundane, right? A piece of daily bread is much needed. And, we, and like you said, we, we learn to appreciate it when we have that spiritual attitude. Uh, very good comment. Uh, and actually, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, that verse, uh, uh, Christ Jesus, uh, Though he was rich, he became poor, so we may become rich. I just paraphrase there. But uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9, actually quotes um, verse 9 here in a section on stewardship. If you f might be familiar with uh, that, that uh, stewardship chapter of Scripture, um, that with possessions, we're, we're urged to practice generosity, uh, contentment, and then um, verse 10 will lead us into the warnings of temptations from riches that we, we, we want to be stay away from selfishness, fear of the future, and abuse of power. So let me read verse 10 as it concludes um, the, the, the description of, of the man who fears the Lord and is fears and believes the word of the Lord. Well, it, it, we see the opposite as well. Verse 10, the end of the wicked. The wicked person will see and be frustrated. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Thoughts or questions here on, on any of Psalm 112? 
Oh, Mark raised his hand, but no, he did not. All right, we'll move on here and move on to uh, Psalm 113. And uh, praise the Lord, it begins as hallelujah. And uh, this, the, this section, um, 113 through 118, are known as the hallel or the Passover hallel. Hallel is the Hebrew word for praise. And this section became a standard part of the Passover celebration. Uh, 113 to 113 were read before the meal at Passover, uh, 116 to 118 after the meal. Um, maybe associated with a meal, this is why these Psalms are so brief and so short. Um, we wanna, I, I think when, at those times of, the, of uh, when we pray before the meal, um, Sometimes that stomach gets to rumble and we say, come on, let, let's finish this prayer. Don't make it lengthy. Um, I actually talked with another pastor earlier this week and he was talking about, uh, uh, you know, an one of the Bible, Bible classes uh, on, uh, for membership, the introduction to, to scripture. And the section on prayer said, you want to make your prayers short. And he said, no. You don't make your prayer short. Jesus prayed all night. Why, why do you need to keep your prayer short? And, um, and I think about uh, you ladies at, at, at a potluck meal. If I were to pray for about 10 minutes before we sit down to eat at, uh, at a Passover meal after we've just had a worship service, um, it, that would be a, a place for a, a briefer prayer than 10 minutes. Uh, well, yeah, so we, we thank the Lord and, and we, we enjoy the blessings he gives. So uh, just a few thoughts on, on maybe why these brief psalms are used before the Passover meal. Um, how is the, this, uh, this uh, Passover Hallel introduced with Psalm 113? Well, the mighty God, and he's the one who accomplished the Passover deliverance. Oh, we set the table with, with a very brief description here. Uh, Sue, would you read about the mighty deliverer here, the invitation to praise, and take all nine verses, if you don't mind, of Psalm 113. Oh, very good. Praise the Lord. Praise you, servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed from now to eternity, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. High above all the nations is the Lord. His glory towers above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? He is seated on high. He bends down to look at the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the garbage pile to set them with nobles, with nobles of his people. He is the one who settles the barren woman in her home as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Yeah, thank, thank you for reading there. Yeah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And um, verses one through three, really, as we think about this, uh, praising the Lord, everybody's encouraged to do it, to, that we would bless, right? Uh, there's a difference between us blessing the Lord and him blessing us. When we bless the Lord, we're just echoing what's true. When the Lord blesses or speaks well of us, he brings it about. But we speak what is true. We want to be associated with that message, repeating what is true about him, his, his goodness. Where? In every place um, and every time, right? From the rising of the sun to its setting, I think east to west uh, there, but then also the, the morning to evening, uh, every time and every place. That, that concept comes out in, in verse three. Um, we have a general description of the Lord here as the basis for the praise. Um, he is the deliverer, a mighty deliverer. Um, and as he is uh, described, we say, yeah, this is why I praise you. Uh, verse five, who is like the Lord our God? He, why? He is the one and only God. There's no other one like him, right? And how high is he? He's seated on high. Um, he has to bend down to see what's so high for us. He has to bend down to see the, the tallest heavens. Um, that reminds me of, of the Tower of Babel. You remember the people of Babel said, we're going to build this tower to go up to God and be like God. And the next verse in Genesis there says, the Lord went down to see what they were doing. So, it, you know, that, that really, yeah, God had to come down and these people were so working so hard to get up to him. 
and then the, the, the power that he has ruling the nation seated on high. Uh, but he, he's a personal God. He's not removed, even though he is so high up. Um, he uses his power to help people, right? The needy brings them out of the garbage pile, right? The, the poor brings them out of the dust and the barren woman. Um, verses seven and eight, very close to the words of Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2, 8. You know who Hannah was, right? The mother of Samuel. And, uh, and the barren woman it definitely applies to her throughout, throughout her song because she was granted that opportunity to, to give birth to Samuel and dedicated him to the Lord. Um, we definitely see, see how that applies to Hannah. Um, but then also uh, just a few comments here that God helping the lonely occurred when he led Israel out of Egypt. But an even more outstanding example of God lifting up the poor and the needy, uh, the humble, was God's son being born of a virgin. And so mm -hmm. even uh, while not a barren woman, um, we have a woman who, who by science would not have been able to have a baby, a, a virgin. Well, so Mary's song echoes this theme uh, of Hannah's song that he would lift it up the lowly. And um, maybe I should have pulled out my hymnal to be able to sing the Magnificat that, uh, that Mary sang. He has hit, lifted up the lowly is definitely part of that song. Uh, questions or comments here from Psalm 113, uh, the mighty deliverer and the pa Passover Hallel. Mark's being extremely quiet this morning. So well, he, he's thinking. Uh, you have hit the point already. I think you bent down to look at the heavens. And uh, the, uh, that is, you know, I always look at all of them. And so look down at the heavens. And uh, how people think. Well, heaven is where God resides. That's where God is. God is above all. He, uh, he looks down on the heavens. Yes, he is in heaven, but he looks down on the heavens. He looks down on the earth. Yeah. So, yeah even, even though we think God is up there seated on the clouds, and, and no, he's not. What, what did the Russian cosmonauts say when he went up to heaven to look for God? I didn't see God. I just saw that humans were able to get up there and, and reach that place. God's not there. Oh, he didn't see God because God's even above, uh, above the highest planet, right? God, God is above all of it. Yeah, good, good thought. Right, anything else on Psalm 113, this mighty deliverer? All right, so then we're going to go on to the second before me Passover meal psalm. Psalm 114, when Israel came out of Egypt. And you know what, Mark, I don't think I had you read yet. So could you, again, we don't have any heading here. We just have the title, when Israel came out of Egypt. And if you take these eight verses um, for us today. When Israel came out of Egypt and the house of Jacob from the people with a strange language. Judah became his sanctuary. Israel became his kingdom. The sea saw and fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What happened, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back. O mountains that you skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Tremble in the presence of the Lord, O earth. Tremble in the presence of God of Jacob. He turned back. He turned the rock into a pool of water. He turned flint into springs of water. So you can see how, how this would apply to, to the Passover meal, can't you? Um, that, uh, that this is, yeah, Israel coming out of Egypt, and that's what the Passover meal was all about. And, and what, what a neat way to, to have all this happen. You remember that the Passover meal was celebrated so that Israel would not forget the works and the word of the Lord, right? 
What do they do at the Passover meal? The elder of the house, the father of the house, would tell the children the story of the Exodus, how Israel came out of Egypt. And right, came out, that, that is the word Exodus uh, that, that we have before us. Um, and so th this is actually a very specific example of what we just had in 113, uh, an example of that principle of God the Lord being the mighty deliverer and taking not only that Exodus from Egypt, we can think of the conquest of the promised land, uh, that's why the sea saw it and fled in verse 3. We think of the Red Sea, but then it's not just a repetition, the second half of 3. Not just the Red Sea, but the Jordan also turned back. And, and why did all of these things happen? Well, it wasn't just God establishing Israel, the house of Jacob, as, as another new nation, right? Judah became his sanctuary. He chose to establish his temple among this people. And his word would be preserved in this area. Remember, this is a section on God's word and his works. And this is also the land where the Savior would come up and would arise. Um, and um, using Israel, again, we just had Psalm 113 included with lifting up the lowly. Another specific example. Israel never was, be, was great in war, the influence of the world. Even King David and Solomon, their influence uh, did not extend anywhere nearly as, as far as the physical reach of Egypt or Babylon or the, the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire or, or even the size of the United States of America, right? Israel was humble. And yet God used this small, lowly nation to accomplish great things. The Savior came from there. Um, and then just kind of letting the, letting the Hebrew or the English uh, component come out uh, of the Hebrew repetition, right? The mountains skip like rams, hills. And then you repeat it with, with a question, oh, mountains, uh, that you skip like rams, you hills like lambs, you know, just turning it around a little bit and just, Really saying that question let, lets us see the surprise there um, and that personification. That surprise is there because these inanimate objects, even they recognize uh, that presence of the creator and, and they respond. Uh, questions or comments uh, here, I guess I didn't mention anything on verse eight. We've, we've seen that quite often. Uh, water in the desert, uh, uh, that miracle that, that he used to, to preserve Israel in their wanderings and lead them to the promised land. Uh, Carol, please share. When you were talking before about these uh, Psalms being short and part of the Seder meal, <clears throat> I, I don't know a whole lot about what that meal entails other than what we've talked about today. But this, didn't the food that they ate represent some of this so when you talk about the the psalms being small are there breaks in between when they do other things with the food on the table I, and it kind of reminded me like our our communion service because we praise the lord we remember why we're doing it and we give thanks afterwards yeah, yeah, there are definite some relations between that Seder meal and the new covenant of Holy Communion um, because uh, Jesus instituted Holy Communion during that meal. Um, and, and a lot of the, what does the, what, what is involved, I've actually never participated, like you said, never participated in a Seder meal and, and, and some of the traditions that were were added and, and involved to underscore was commanded of God. What was commanded? Tell the children about the exodus from Egypt and then eat the specific things that they did that night, right? Bread without yeast, the bitter herbs, uh, the, don't break the bone uh, of, the Passover, uh, of the Passover lamb, uh, you paint the blood on the doorposts, remember the Passover, uh, the angel of death and the death of the firstborn and leaving Egypt. 
So those are the things that I take home every time I think of this, this Passover meal. I'm not sure about how, how often, you know, probably some words from the elder when they would share those bitter herbs, uh, when they would have that yeast or begin to bake the yeast during Passover, not the bake, bake the bread without yeast during the Passover meal. Yeah, a lot of teaching that goes on and using these words to review, review the history. I don't know if that, that speaks to your comment, Carol, but uh, you can follow up if you would like. Yes, no, that, 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 thank you. Uh, Sue, anything to add? Um, well, question. Um, obviously, the, um, the Psalms are recorded. Um, I'm just thinking back, uh, wondering historically, um, when all the um, kings of Israel were um, disregarding God and, and um, going to other um, going to other gods, uh, did the did the this Passover nearly get uh, lost at that time? And did, it got brought back, obviously, because Jesus um, used uh, the Passover, like you were just saying, the Passover meal before he died. Um, I'm just wondering, do we have any idea how that recommendation to keep telling this to your sons and, and sharing the story, how it managed to get through that period of the, the kings? The power of God, right? And him saying his word will endure and he, and he will not let it be, let it be forgotten. And, and good, very good question, because uh, remember Ezekiel, the prophet, asked that very same question. Uh, God, I'm the only one left who's following you. Yeah, nobody else is going to be celebrating the Passover this year, God. I'm the only one left. Remember God's answer? Yeah, go out and do your work of a prophet and, and uh, be an instrument of my word, including the judgment and the gospel. But oh, by the way, Ezekiel, not, not Ezekiel, Elijah. Uh, by the way, Elijah, I've got 7,000 people in Israel who haven't bowed a knee to Baal. Uh, that's not even counting the folks who are still left in Judah. God worked it out to preserve his line. And, and even through these bad, the, the bad and, and idolatrous kings, and even with uh, the influence of those bad kings um, profaning the worship in the temple in Jerusalem as that happened, he allowed the kings like Josiah and Hezekiah to, at just the right time, when yeah, the, the kingdom of, of Judah was on the verge of collapse and falling totally into idolatry and being overrun, Hezekiah and Josiah were kings God brought to bring reform and, and reestablish and, and, and revive the use of the word. So... Um, so yeah, God worked it out. Um, yeah, Mark, please. <clears throat> I was putting down here how quickly man forgets what all that occurred. I was thinking that the uh, the uh, Israelites, you know, the they wandered for forty years. A lot of them who experienced <clears throat> coming from Egypt were no longer there, and the younger we have tendencies to forget. Uh, I read something last night, someone says, you think we'll ever forget about 9-11? And I said, well, you take a look at Pearl Harbor, you take a look at the uh, sinking of the Maine and all the things that occurred years ago, it doesn't have as much significance because the future generations did not this, you know, in God's word, it continues to remind us of that to refresh our minds. And, uh, um, he had been there for us. He will continue to be there for us as long as we believe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Did just, I don't know if you heard all of what Mark said in the good, good discussion about the human mind and our ability to, to forget uh, and things in history that were very very important and, and influential. He started wars or ended wars and things like that. Those things can be eventually forgotten by human beings, but God has said his word will not. 
and he, he brings it back to us. Um, I just wanted to go back to one other thing that I remembered I wanted to comment on here with the C and the, uh, the, uh, the red, uh, red Sea um, and Israel passing through that great deed. Um, you recall that uh, how, what happened with the Red Sea? The waters were parted. They, it stood up on both sides. And what happened? The wind blew and they went through on dry land to dry out the land. It wasn't a hurricane that made the, you know, that sucked up the water and, and made, give them an area to, to walk through, uh, what, whatever that was. Uh, no, it wasn't just the receding of the tides, a miraculous thing. The Jordan actually was, Israel crossed the Jordan in a different way. Uh, since Jordan was a flowing river, um, the Lord actually made a miraculous dam. So there was only water on one side when Israel crossed the Jordan, but it actually talks about how far that water that continued to run how far it was backed up and that even flooded the, the countryside and, and towns up, uphill, um, up, upstream. Uh, verse four, taken in conjunction with the Jordan, uh, people who say, oh yeah, let me try to explain what God did with the Jordan. The mountain skipped. So God must have actually had a hur an earthquake that made the mountains fall and make an actual dam of the Jordan River. And so that's how the Israelites crossed. And then God let the mountains skip again, another earthquake, and that river opened up, and the, and the floodgates of that river let the Israelites go through. No, don't, don't speculate. We, God didn't, he could have used an earthquake, uh, but, but there's nothing in, the, in the Joshua, the book of Joshua, about an earthquake causing the Jordan to turn back. Just a miracle of God. It's going to be a miracle no matter what. We don't have to embellish it with how we would have liked to have done the miracle. Um, but uh, yet speaking to, speaking to that, that personification. Uh, questions or comments here as we wrap this up? I guess four brief Psalms and, and uh, uh, we got through this a little quicker than normal, but not extremely short. So now that we've done the Passover Hillel with, um, the brief thoughts of four brief psalms. Now we get to go dine on God's word in worship this morning. And if you haven't done so, you're welcome to uh, catch a, a meal of God's word online with uh, uh, the video of the sermon on YouTube. Um, uh, why don't we close with, with a prayer? Uh, hallelujah, Lord. Praise the Lord. We praise you for your works and for your word. Always grant us your Holy Spirit that we may remember and trust and believe your promises. In Jesus' name, amen.